Monkey on His Back by Charles V. DeVette this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Monkey on His Back by Charles V. DeVette He was walking endlessly down a long glass-walled corridor. Bright sunlight slanted in through one wall on the blue knapsack across his shoulders. Who he was, and what he was doing here was clouded. The truth lurked in some corner of his consciousness but it was not breached by surface awareness. The corridor opened at last into a large high-domed room, much like a railway station or an air terminal. He walked straight ahead. At the sight of him a man leaning negligently against a stone pillar to his right, but within vision, straightened and barked an order to him. Halt! He lengthened his stride, but gave no other sign. Two men hurried through a doorway of a small anteroom to his left, calling to him. He turned away and began to run. Shouts and the sound of charging feet came from behind him. He cut to the right, running toward the escalator to the second floor. Another pair of men were hurrying down, two steps at a stride. With no break in pace, he veered into an opening beside the escalator. At the first turn he saw that the aisle merely circled the stairway, coming out into the depot again on the other side. It was a trap. He glanced quickly around him. At the rear of the space was a row of lockers for travelers' use. He slipped a coin into a pay slot, opened the zipper on his bag, and pulled out a flat briefcase. It took him only a few seconds to push the case into the compartment, lock it, and slide the key along the floor beneath the locker. There was nothing to do after that, except wait. The men pursuing him came hurtling around the turn in the aisle. He kicked his knapsack to one side, spreading his feet wide with an instinctive motion. Until that instant he had intended to fight. Now he swiftly reassessed the odds. There were five of them he saw. He should be able to incapacitate two or three and break out. But the fact that they had been expecting him meant that others would very probably be waiting outside. His best course now was to sham ignorance. He relaxed. He offered no resistance as they reached him. They were not gentle men. A tall ruffian, copper-brown face, damp with perspiration and body oil, grabbed him by the jacket and slammed him back against the lockers. As he shifted his weight to keep for his footing, someone drove a fist into his face. He started to raise his hands, and a hard, flat object crashed against the side of his skull. The starch went out of his legs. "'Do you make anything out of it?' The psychoanalyst Milton Bergstrom asked. John Zarwell shook his head. Did I talk while I was under? Oh, yes, you were supposed to. That way I follow pretty well what we're reenacting. How does it tie in with what I told you before? Bergstrom's neat bone, fair skinned face betrayed no emotion other than an introspective stillness of his normally alert gaze. I see no connection, he decided, his words once again precise and meticulous. We don't have enough to go on. Do you feel able to try another coma analysis this afternoon yet? I don't see why not. Zarwell opened the collar of his shirt. The day was hot, and the room had no air conditioning, still a rare luxury in St. Martin's. The office window was open, but it let in no freshness only the mildly rank odor that pervaded all the planet's habitable area. Good. Bergstrom rose. The serum is quite harmless, John. He maintained a professional diversionary chatter as he administered the drug, a scopolamine derivative that's been well tested. The floor beneath Zarwell's feet assumed abruptly the near-transfluent consistency of a damp sponge. It rose in a foot-high wave and rolled gently toward the far wall. Bergstrom continued talking with practiced urbanity. When psychiatry was a less exact science, his voice went on, seeming to come from a great distance. A doctor had to spend weeks, sometimes months through year, interviewing a patient. If he was skilled enough, he could sort their relevancies from the vast amount of shaft. We were able now, with the help of the serum, to confine our discourses to matters cogent to the patient's trouble. The floor continued its transmutation, 
and Zarwell sank deep into the viscous depths. Lie back and relax. Don't. The words tumbled down from above. They faded, were gone. Zarwell found himself standing on a vast plain. There was no sky above and no horizon in the distance. He was in a place without space or dimension. There was nothing here except himself and the gun that he held in his hand. A weapon, beautiful with its efficient simplicity. He should know all about the instrument, its purpose and workings, but he could not bring his thoughts into rational focus. His forehead creased with his mental effort. Abruptly the unreality about him shifted perspective. He was approaching, not walking, but merely shortening the space between them. The man who held the gun, the man who was himself, the other himself, drifted nearer also, as though drawn by a mutual attraction. The man with the gun raised his weapon and pressed the trigger. With the action the perspective shifted again. He was watching the face of the man he shot jerk and twitch, expand and contract. The face was unharmed, yet it was no longer the same no longer his own features. The stranger face smiled approvingly at him. Odd, Bergstrom said. He brought his hands up and joined the tips of his fingers against his chest. But it's another piece of the jigsaw. In time it will fit into place, he paused. It means more to you than the first, I suppose. No, Zarwell answered. He was not a talking man, Bergstrom reflected. It was more than reticence, however. The man had a hard granite core, only partially concealed by his present perplexity. He was a man who could handle himself well in an emergency. Bergstrom shrugged, dismissing his strayed thoughts. I expected as much, a quite normal first phase of treatment. He straightened a paper on his desk. I think that will be enough for today. Twice in one sitting is about all we ever try. Otherwise, some particular episode might cause undue mental stress and set up a block. He glanced down at his appointment pad. Tomorrow at two, then. Sarwell grunted acknowledgment and pushed himself to his feet, apparently unaware that his shirt clung damply to his body. The sun was still high when Sarwell left the analyst's office. The white marble of the city's buildings shimmered in the afternoon heat, squat and austere as giant tree trunks, pockmarked and gray mottled with windows. Sarwell was careful not to rest his hand on the flesh searing surface of the stone. The evening meal hour was approaching when he reached the flats on the way to his apartment. The streets of the old section were near deserted. The only sounds he heard as he passed were the occasional cry of a baby chronically uncomfortable in the day's heat, and the lowing of imported cattle waiting in a nearby shed to be shipped to the country. All St. Martin's has a distinctive smell, as of an arid, dried-out swamp with a faint taint of fish. But in the flats the odor changes. Here is the smell of factories, warehouses, and trading marts, the smell of stale cooking drifting from the homes of the laborers and lower-class techmen who live here. Zarwell passed a group of smaller children, playing a desultory game of lick-lick for pieces of candy and cigarettes. Slowly he climbed the stairs of a stone flat. He prepared a supper for himself and ate it without either enjoyment or distaste. He lay down fully clothed on his bed. The visit to the analyst had done nothing to dispel his ennui. The next morning, when Zarwell awoke, he lay for a moment unmoving. The feeling was there again, like a scene waiting only to be gazed at directly to be perceived. It was as though a great wisdom lay at the edge of understanding. If he rested quietly, it would all come to him. Yet always, when his mind lost its sleep-induced lethargy, the moment of near understanding slipped away. This morning, however, the sense of disorientation did not pass with full wakefulness. He achieved no understanding, but the strangeness did not leave as he sat up. He gazed about him. 
the room did not seem to be his own the furnishings and the clothing he observed in a closet might have belonged to a stranger he pulled himself from his blankets his body moving with mechanical reaction the slippers into which he put his feet were larger than he had expected them to be he walked about the small apartment the place was familiar but only as it would have been if he had studied it from blueprints not as though he lived there feeling was still with him when he returned to the psychoanalyst seen this time was more kaleidoscopic less personal a village was being ravaged men struggled and died in the streets zarwell moved among them seldom taking part in the individual clashes yet a moving force in the conflict the background changed he understood that he was on a different world here a city burned its resistance was nearing its end zarwell was riding a shaggy pony outside a high wall surrounding the stricken metropolis he moved in and joined a party of short bearded men directing them as they battered at the wall with a huge log mounted on a many wheeled truck the log broke a breach in the concrete and the besiegers charged through carrying back the defenders who sought vainly to plug the gap soon there would be rioting in the streets again plundering and killing zarwell was not the leader of the invaders only a lesser figure in the rebellion but he had played a leading part in the planning of the strategy that led to the city's fall the job had been well done time passed without visible break in the panorama now zarwell was fleeing pursued by the same bearded men who had been his comrades before still he moved with the same firm purpose diligent resourceful and well prepared for the eventuality that had befallen he made his escape without difficulty he alighted from a spaceship on still another world another shift in time and the atmosphere of conflict engulfed him weary but resigned he accepted it and did what he had to do bergstrom was regarding him with speculative scrutiny you have had quite a past apparently he observed zarwell smiled with mild embarrassment at least in my dreams dreams bergstrom's eyes widened in surprise oh i beg your pardon i must have forgotten to explain this work is so routine for me that sometimes i forget it's all new to a patient actually what you experienced under the drug were not dreams they were recollections of real episodes from your past zarwell's expression became wary he watched bergstrom closely after a minute however he seemed satisfied and he let himself settle back against the cushion of his chair i remember nothing of what i saw he observed that's why you're here you know bergstrom answered to help you remember but everything under the drug is so haphazard that's true the recall episodes are always purely random with no chronological sequence our problem will be to reassemble them in proper order later or some particular scene may trigger a complete memory return it is my considered opinion bergstrom went on that your lost memory will turn out to be no ordinary amnesia i believe we will find that your mind has been tampered with nothing i've seen on the drug fits into that past i do remember that's what makes me so certain bergstrom said confidentially you don't remember what we have shown to be true conversely then what you think you remember must be false it must have been implanted there but we can go into that later for today i think we've done enough this episode was quite prolonged won't have any time off again until next weekend zarwell reminded him that's right bergstrom thought for a moment we shouldn't let this hang too long could you come here after work tomorrow i suppose i could fine bergstrom said with satisfaction i'll admit i'm considerably more than casually interested in your case by this time a work truck picked Sarwell up the next morning, and he rode with a tech crew to the edge of the reclaim area. Beside the belt, 
bringing ocean muck from the converter plant at the seashore his bulldozer was waiting he took his place behind the drive wheel and began working dirt down between windbreakers anchored in the rock along a makeshift road into the bedlands trucks brought crushed lime and phosphorus to supplement the ocean sediment the progress of life from the sea to the land was the mechanical process of this growing world Nearly two hundred years ago, when Earth established a colony on St. Martin's, the land surface of the planet had been barren. Only its seas thrived with animal and vegetable life. The necessary machinery and technicians had been supplied by Earth, and the long struggle began to fit the world for human needs. When Zarwell arrived six months before, the vitalized area already extended three hundred miles along the coast and sixty miles inland and every day the progress continued. A large percentage of the energy and resources of the world were devoted to that essential expansion. The Reclam crews filled and sodded the sterile rock, planted binding grasses, grain, and trees, and diverted rivers to keep it fertile. When there were no rivers to divert, they blasted out springs and lakes in the foothills to make their own biologists developed the necessary germ and insect life from what they found in the sea where that failed they imported microorganisms from earth three rubber track crawlers picked their way down from the mountains until they joined the road passing the belt they were loaded with ore that would be smelted into metal for depleted earth or for other colonies short of minerals it was st martin's only export thus far Sarwell pulled his sun-helmet lower, to better guard his hot, dry features. The wind blew continuously on St. Martin's, but it furnished small relief from the heat, after its three-thousand-mile journey across scorched, sterile rock. It sucked the moisture from a man's body, bringing a membrane-shrinking dryness to the nostrils as it was breathed in. With it came also the cloying taste of limestone in a worker's mouth. Zarwell gazed idly about the other laborers. Fully three-quarters of them were very rhabdo-ridden. A cure for the skin fungus had not yet been found. The men's faces and hands were scabbed and red. The colony had grown to near self-sufficiency, would soon have a moderate prosperity, yet they still lacked adequate medical and research facilities. Not all the world's citizens were content. Bergstrom was waiting in his office when Zarwell arrived that evening. He was lying motionless on a hard cot, with his eyes closed, yet with every sense sharply quickened. Tentatively, he tightened small muscles in his arms and legs. Across his wrists and thighs, he felt straps binding him to the cot. Oh, that's our big, bad man, a coarse voice above him observed caustically. He doesn't look so tough now, does he? It might have been better to kill him right away, a second less confident voice said. It's supposed to be impossible to hold him. Don't be stupid. We just do what we're told. We'll hold him. What do you think they'll do with him? Execute him, I suppose, the harsh voice said matter-of-factly. They're probably just curious to see what he looks like first. They'll be disappointed. Zarwell opened his eyes, a slit, to observe his surroundings. It was a mistake. He's out of it, the first speaker said, and Zarwell allied his eyes to open fully. The voice he saw belonged to the big man who had bruised him against the locker at the spaceport. Irrelevantly, he wondered how he knew now that it had been a spaceport. His captor's broad face jeered down at Zarwell. "'Have a good sleep?' he asked him, with mock solicitude. Zarwell did not deign to acknowledge that he heard. The big man turned. "'You can tell the chief he's awake,' he said. Zarwell followed his gaze to where a younger man with a blond lock of hair on his forehead stood behind him. The youth nodded and went out, while the other pulled a chair up to the other side of Zarwell's cot. While their attention was away from him, Zarwell had unobtrusively loosened his bonds as much as possible with arm leverage. As the big man drew his chair near, 
He made the hand farthest from him tight and compact, and worked it free from the leather strap. He waited. The big man belched. You're supposed to be great stuff in a situation like this, he said, his smoke-tanned face splitting in a grin that revealed large square teeth. How about giving me a sample? You're a yellow-livered bastard, Sarwell told him. The grin faded from the oily face as the man stood up. He leaned over the cot, and Zarwell's left hand shot up and locked about his throat, joined almost immediately by the right. The man's mouth opened, and he tried to yell as he threw himself frantically backward. He clawed at the hands about his neck. When that failed to break the grip, he suddenly reversed his weight and drove his fist at Zarwell's head. Zarwell pulled the struggling body down against his chest and held it there until all agitated movement ceased. He sat up then letting the body slide to the floor. The straps about his thighs came loose with little effort. The analyst dubbed at his upper lip with a handkerchief. The episodes are beginning to tie together, he said, with an attempt at nonchalance. The next couple should do it. Zarwell did not answer. His memory seemed to be on the point of complete return, and he sat quietly, hopefully. However, nothing more came, and he returned his attention to his immediate problem. Opening a button on his shirt, he pulled back a strip of plastic cloth just below his rib cage, and took out a small, flat pistol. He held it in the palm of his hand. He knew now why he always carried it. Bergstrom had his bad moment. You're not going to. He began at the sight of the gun. He tried again. You must be joking. I have very little sense of humor, Sarwell corrected him. You'd be foolish. Bergstrom obviously realized how close he was to death. Yet surprisingly, after the first start, he showed little fear. Sarwell had thought the man a bit soft, to adjust it to a life of ease and some prestige, to meet danger calmly. Curiosity restrained his trigger finger. Why would I be foolish, he asked. Your Menninger oath of inviolable confidence? Bergstrom shook his head. I know it's been broken before, but you need me. You're not through, you know. If you killed me, you'd still have to trust some other analyst. Is that the best you can do? No. Bergstrom was angry now. But use that logical mind you're supposed to have. Scenes before this have shown what kind of man you are. Just because this last happened here on St. Martin's makes little difference. If I was going to turn you into the police, I'd have done it before this. Zarwell debated with himself the truth of what the other had said. Why don't you turn me in? he asked. Because you're no mad dog killer. Now that the crisis seemed to be past, Bergstrom spoke more calmly, even allowed himself to relax. You're still pretty much in the fog about yourself. I read more in these common analyses than you did. Even know who you are. Zarwell's eyebrows raised. Who am I? he asked, very interested now. Without attention, he put his pistol away in a trouser pocket. Bergstrom brushed the question aside with one hand. Your name makes little difference. You've used many. But you are an, an idealist. Your killings were necessary to bring justice to the place you visited. By now you're almost a legend among the human worlds. I'd like to talk more with you on that later. While Zarwell considered, Bergstrom pressed his advantage. One more scene might do it, he said. Should we try again, if you trust me, that is? Zarwell made his decision quickly. Go ahead, he answered. All Zarwell's attention seemed on this cigar he lit as he rode down the escalator but he surveyed the terminal carefully over the rim of his hand. He spied no suspicious loungers. Behind the escalator, he groped along the floor beneath the lockers until he found his key. The briefcase was under his arm a minute later. In the basement lab, he put a coin in the face slot for a private compartment and went in. As he zipped open the briefcase, he surveyed his features in the mirror. A small muscle at the corner of one eye twitched spasmodically. One cheek wore a frozen quarter smile. Thirty-six hours under the paralysis was longer than advisable. 
the muscles should be rested at least every twenty hours. Fortunately, his natural features would serve as an adequate disguise now. He adjusted the ring setting on the pistol-shaped instrument that he took from his case, and carefully rayed several small areas of his face, loosening muscles that had been tight too long. He sighed gratefully when he finished, massaging his cheeks and forehead with considerable pleasure. Another glance in the mirror satisfied him with the changes that had been made. He turned to his briefcase again and exchanged the gun for a small syringe, which he pushed into a trouser pocket and a single-edged razor blade. Removing his fiber-cloth jacket, he slashed it into strips with the razor blade and flushed it down the disposal bowl. With the sleeves of his blouse rolled up, he had the appearance of a typical workman as he strolled from the compartment. Back at the locker, he replaced the briefcase and, with a wad of gum, glued the key to the bottom of the locker frame. One step more, taking the syringe from his pocket, he plunged the needles into his forearm and tossed the instrument down a waist chute. He took three more steps and paused uncertainly. When he looked about him, it was with the expression of a man walking from a vivid dream. Quite ingenious, Graves muttered admiringly. You had your mind already preconditioned for the shot, but why would you deliberately give yourself amnesia? What better disguise than to believe the part you're playing? A good man must have done that job on your mind, Bergstrom commented. I'd have hesitated to try it myself. It must have taken a lot of trust on your part. Trust and money, Zarwell said dryly. Memories back then. Zarwell nodded. I'm glad to hear that, Bergstrom assured him. Now that you're well again, I'd like to introduce you to a man named Vernon Johnson. This world... Zarwell stopped him with an unbraced hand. Good God, man! Can't you see the reason for all this? I'm tired. I'm trying to quit. Quit? Bergstrom did not quite follow him. It started on my home colony, Zarwell explained listlessly. A gang of hoods had taken over the government. I helped organize a movement to get them out. There was some bloodshed, but it went quite well. Several months later, an unofficial envoy from another world asked several of us to give them a hand on the same kind of job. The political conditions were rotten. We went with him. Again, we were successful. It seems I have a kind of genius for that sort of thing. He stretched out his legs and regarded them thoughtfully. I learned then the truth of Russell's saying, When the oppressed win their freedom, they are as oppressive as their former masters. When they went bad, I opposed them. This time I failed, but I escaped again. I have quite a talent for that also. I'm not a professional do-gooder. Zarwell's tone appealed to Bergstrom for understanding. I have only a normal man's indignation at injustice. And now I've done my share. Yet wherever I go, the word eventually gets out. And I'm right back in a fight again. It's like the proverbial monkey on my back. I can't get rid of it. He rose. That disguise and memory planting were supposed to get me out of it. I should have known it wouldn't work. But this time I'm not going to be drawn back in. You and your Vernon Johnson can do your own revolting. I'm through. Bertram did not argue as he left. Restlessness drove Zarwell from his flat the next day a legal holiday on St. Martin's. At a railed-off lot he stopped and loitered in the shadow of an adjacent building watching workmen drilling an excavation for a new structure. When a man strolled to his side and stood watching the workmen, he was not surprised. He waited for the other to speak. "'I'd like to talk to you, if you can spare a few minutes,' the stranger said. Zarwell turned and studied the man without answering. He was medium tall, with the body of an athlete, though perhaps ten years beyond the age of sports. He had a manner of contained energy. "'You're Johnson?' he asked. The man nodded. Zarwell tried to feel the anger he wanted to feel, but somehow it would not come. "'We've nothing to talk about,' was the best he could manage. "'Then we just listen. After, I'll leave if you tell me to.' 
Against his will he found himself liking the man, and wanting at least to be courteous. He inclined his head toward a curved waist-box, with a flat top. Should we sit? Johnson smiled agreeably, and they walked over to the box and sat down. When this colony was first founded, Johnson began without preamble. The administrative body was a governor, and a council of twelve. Their successors were to be elected biennially. At first they were. Then things changed. We haven't had an election now in the last twenty-three years. St. Martin's is beginning to prosper. Yet the only ones receiving the benefits are the rulers. The citizens work twelve hours a day. They are poorly housed, poorly fed, poorly clothed. They... Zarwell found himself not listening as Johnson's voice went on. The story was always the same. But why did they always try to drag him into their troubles? Why hadn't he chose some other world on which to hide? The last question prompted a new thought. Just why had he chosen St. Martin's? Was it only a coincidence, or had he subconsciously at least picked this particular world? He'd always considered himself the unwilling subject of glib persuaders. But mightn't some inner compulsion of his own have put the monkey on his back? And we need your help, Johnson had finished his speech. Sarwell gazed up at the bright sky. He pulled in a long breath and let it out in a sigh. What are your plans so far? he asked wearily. End of Monkey on His Back by Charles V. DeVette No Pets Allowed by M. A. Cummings This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rigel No Pets Allowed by M. A. Cummings I can't tell anyone about it. In the first place, they'd never believe me. And if they did, I'd probably be punished for having her, because we aren't allowed to have pets of any kind. It wouldn't have happened if they hadn't sent me way out there to work. But you see, there are so many things I can't do. I remember the day the chief of vocation took me before the council. I've tried him on a dozen things, he reported. People always talk about me as if I can't understand what they mean, but I'm really not that dumb. There doesn't seem to be a thing he can do the chief went on. Actually, his intelligence seems to be no greater than that which we believe our ancestors had back in the twentieth century. As bad as that, observed one of the council members. You do have a problem. But we must find something for him to do, said another. We can't have an idle person in the state. It's unthinkable. But what? asked the chief. He's utterly incapable of running any of the machines. I've tried to teach him. The only things he can do are already being done much better by robots. There was a long silence, broken at last by one little old council member. I have it, he cried. The very thing. We'll make him guard of the treasure. But there's no need of a guard. No one will touch the treasure without permission. We haven't had a dishonest person in the state for more than 3,000 years. That's it exactly. There aren't any dishonest people so there won't be anything for him to do. But we will have solved the problem of his idleness. It might be a solution, said the chief. At least, a temporary one. I suppose we will have to find something else later on. But this will give us time to look for something. So I became guard of the treasure, with a badge, and nothing to do, unless you count watching the key. The gates were kept locked, just as they were in the old days, but the large key hung beside them. Of course, no one wanted to bother carrying it around. It was too heavy. The only ones who ever used it, anyway, were members of the council. As the man said, we haven't had a dishonest person in the state for thousands of years. Even I know that much. Of course, this left me with lots of time on my hands. That's how I happened to get her in the first place. I'd always wanted one, but pets were forbidden. Busy people didn't have time for them, so I knew I was breaking the law, 
but I figured that no one would ever find out. First, I fixed a place for her and made a brush screen so that she couldn't be seen by anyone coming to the gates. Then, one night, I sneaked into the forest and got her. It wasn't so lonely after that. Now I had someone to talk to. She was small when I got her. It would be too dangerous to go near a full-grown one, but she grew rapidly. That was because I caught small animals and brought them to her. Not having to depend on what she could catch, she grew almost twice as fast as usual and was so sleek and pretty. Really, she was a pet to be proud of. I don't know how I could have stood the four months there alone if I hadn't her to talk to. I don't think she really understood me, but I pretended she did, and that helped. Every three or four weeks, three of the council members came to take a part of the treasure, or to add to it. Always three of them. That's why I was so surprised one day to see one man coming by himself. It was Grem, the little old member who had recommended that I be given this job. I was happy to see him, and we talked for a while, mostly about my work and how I liked it. I almost told him about my pet, but I didn't because he might be angry at me for breaking the law. Finally, he asked me to give him the key. I've been sent to get something from the treasure, he explained. I wasn't happy to displease him, but I said, I can't let you have it. There must be three members. You know that. Of course I know it. But something came up suddenly, so they sent me alone. Now let me have it. I shook my head. That was the one order they had given me, never to give the key to any one person who came alone. Grem became quite angry. You idiot, he shouted. Why do you think I had you put out here? It was so I could get in there and help myself to the treasure. But that would be dishonest. And there are no dishonest people in the state. For three thousand years, I know. His usually kind face had an ugly look I'd never seen before. But I'm going to get a part of that treasure. And it won't do you any good to report it, because no one is going to take the word of a fool like you against a respected council member. They'll think you are the dishonest one. Now, give me that key. It's a terrible thing to disobey a council member. But if I obeyed him, I would be disobeying all the others. And that would be worse. No, I shouted. He threw himself upon me. For his size and age, he was very strong. Stronger, even, than I. I fought as hard as I could, but I knew I wouldn't be able to keep him away from the key for very long. And if he took the treasure, I would be blamed. The council would have to think a new punishment for dishonesty. Whatever it was, it would be terrible indeed. He drew back and rushed at me. Just as he hit me, my foot caught upon a root and I fell. His rush carried him past me and he crashed through the brush screen beside the path. I heard him scream twice, then there was silence. I was bruised all over, but I managed to pull myself up and take away what was left of the screen. There was no sign of Grem but my beautiful pet was waving her pearl-green feelers as she always did in thanks for a good meal. That's why I can't tell anyone what happened. No one would believe that Grem would be dishonest. And I can't prove it because she ate the proof. Even if I did tell them, no one is going to believe that a flycatcher plant, even a big one like mine, would actually be able to eat a man. So they think that Grem disappeared. And I'm still out here with her. She's grown so much larger now, and more beautiful than ever. But I hope she hasn't developed a taste for human flesh. Lately, when she stretches out her feelers, it seems that she's trying to reach me. End of No Pets Allowed by M.A. Cummings The Odyssey of Sam Meacham by Charles E. Fritch. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lisa S. Ware. The Odyssey of Sam Meacham by Charles E. Fritch. Sam Meacham did not realize that his chance discovery of unlimited power would bring back that which he had lost eight long years ago. 
To look at Sam Meacham, you'd never have dreamed he was a man of decision and potential explorer of the unknown. In fact, there were times when Sam wouldn't either. He was a pink, frail-looking person with a weak chin and shoulders used to stooping, and stereotyped thinking immediately relegated him to the ranks of the meek and mannerly. These, oddly enough, happened to be his characteristics. But that was before he discovered the hyperdrive. In his capacity as an atomic engine inspector, his work was most uncreative. He was a small cog in a large cog-laden machine, a government worker helping to produce engines that would send supplies and immigrants and tourists to the U.S. sector of the moon colony. Day after day, week after week, freshly made engines would come sliding down the conveyor belt, and mechanically, Sam Meacham would attach to each two wires that led from a machine by his side, flip a switch, and if the dial on his machine read at least 50, he could pass the machine on as being adequate for the job of Moon Ferry. He'd been attaching those two wires in place and watching 50s for five years, and it looked as though he'd be doing it for 55 more. Then one day, a defectively wired machine came sliding along, and dutifully, Sam hooked it up and flipped the switch. Automatically, his eyes glanced disinterestedly at the dial showing comparative thrust. His eyes bugged. The needle had passed fifty, had gone to the hundred mark, never before reached. Struck the metal projection, bent, and was whirling in a rapid circle. Sam quickly cut off the motor, then he glanced furtively about to see if anyone had noticed. The room was a flurry of men busy at routine tasks, and none of them seemed particularly interested in anything that was going on at his table. Sam checked his own machine and found the tester in perfect working order. He hesitated a brief moment, then flipped the switch again. He was prepared for the whirl of the dial now, but still it frightened him a little. There must be something wrong. No atomic engine could have that much comparative thrust. Yet... The tester was perfect. Sam Meacham shut off the tester and stood very still for a minute and thought about it. His glance fell on the intricate wiring within the atomic engine, and he saw with a start that it looked different from usual. Wires where wires had never been before, where wires were not supposed to be. With another quick glance about him, Sam began copying the wiring pattern on a sheet of paper. He thrust the paper into his pocket as the foreman came up to him. "'Say, Meacham,' foreman said. "'That last engine okay?' Sam Meacham hesitated briefly, then said, "'The wiring was a little fouled up. Busted the dial on the tester.' The foreman shook his head. "'I was afraid of that. Some wiremen on the third floor came in half drunk a few minutes ago. That was only his first machine, so the others ought to be okay.' He jabbed a finger at the engine. You'd better send it back up. When the foreman was gone, Sam checked the wiring with his diagram to make certain he hadn't made any mistakes, and then he disconnected some of the wires, just in case. For the first time in years, Sam Meacham felt a new freedom. He'd always been a dreamer, hampered by cold reality, a man with his head in the stars and his feet chained to solid earth. He'd wanted to go to the moon when the government first started colonizing, but Dorothy, his wife, talked him out of it. At various times, he had felt that secret longing, that beckoning of the stars, but each time he had shelved the desire and turned to attaching his two wires of the tester to their proper terminals on each atomic engine, and then, when his shift was up, he turned homeward to face an existence equally uninspiring. The moment he had seen that needle pass into the hundreds, Sam Meacham knew what he was going to do. He had planned it years ago, when he first stood alone in the night and gazed upward at the glittering diamonds that lay beyond reach. Even then, he had known what he would do, if ever the opportunity presented itself. In those moments of self-pity that came too often, however, he had told himself that it was only wishful thinking, and cursed himself for being a weakling and a dreamer who did nothing about his dreams. But he had resolved that some day he would go out among the stars. That day had come, and as Sam Meacham went homeward that evening, he felt his heart beat in time with the pulsing light of the stars overhead. 
but with this new exultation he felt a desperate fear, a fear that he might again bypass his opportunity, as he had done so often before. Yet he knew that this was his greatest chance, perhaps his last chance. He must be brave and strong, and above all, confident that his intense longing would make his venture successful. "'How did everything go?' Dorothy asked when he came in. It was a mechanical question, and he answered it mechanically. "'Okay. Everything went as usual.' He didn't want to look at her. She had grown plump since they had married eight years ago, and by not looking at her, he could somehow pretend she was still slim and attractive. She was lying on a couch, wearing a housecoat, and didn't look up from the magazine in front of her. "'Supper's on the table,' she said. For eight years he'd had flat, uninspiring meals, meals that kept one from starving, and no more. His complaints had met with more hostility than he cared to cope with, and always, meekly, he had retired from the scene of battle wishing he had submitted, and thus avoided the tongue-lashing before which he felt so helpless. Once more, in the surroundings that bred it, a familiar, distasteful helplessness rose to envelop Sam Meacham. It came across him as a feeling of despair and bewilderment, and he wondered sickly if he would ever escape this. Yes, he told himself, clenching his fists determinedly. But he would have to bide his time. Slowly, not really tasting it, he ate the cold, uninviting meal set on the table. Securing the engine was the least of his worries, at least from a commercial standpoint. The factory was turning out atomic engines at almost production-line rates, and civilians could easily get them for private use so long as they operated them at low speeds and within the atmosphere of Earth. That last thought drew a long, secret laugh from Sam Meacham. <laughs> at low speeds, the government considered anything above a 50 CT as high speed, and here he was with the secret that could enable him to travel at who knows what speeds. He could give it to the government later, but right now he had his own use for it. Dorothy would prove an obstacle, however. She always was an obstacle, and there was no reason to assume she wouldn't be one now. And he was right about that. The following payday, when he took his check and splurged it on an atomic engine, Dorothy was madder than a uranium pile approaching critical mass. Here I scrimp and save on that measly paycheck you bring home, she wailed. And you go out and buy luxuries we don't need, if we could afford them. Look at this dress. It's old. All my clothes are old. And you know why? You want to know why? Sam Meacham already knew why. It was because, as a manager of his financial affairs, Dorothy was a flop. Often he had wanted to tell her so. But the more times he attempted to open his mouth, the louder she had wailed. It was a lot easier just to let her explode and then fizzle out. Even now he had the desire to shout at her to see what would happen but her shrieks made him grow sullen and unsure of himself. Perhaps he had wasted the money. After all, the engine they had in their outdated model rocket was good for a few years more. But for a long trip through space, it would never do. The explosion was over, and she was merely sizzling. She had folded her arms resolutely, determined that he should cancel the order for the engine immediately. Sam Meacham felt a wave of helplessness surge over him. He felt lost and bewildered. Perhaps she was right. Maybe it was foolish. Here he was, Sam Meacham, 35, whose mediocre living was made attaching two wires to two terminals, day after day, week after week. A man who suddenly saw a pointer go unexpectedly beyond the 50 mark, and who immediately began having delusions of grandeur. He was a dreamer. But dreams and reality were two different things, and sometimes he confused them. He shook his head feeling like a fool. Well? Dorothy's face was before him, determined, demanding. Sam said, All right, I'll take it back. She smiled condescendingly. 
like a mother does when a child admits a wrongdoing. Conditioned responses, Sam thought bitterly. That was the whole trouble. This craveness, this kowtowing before any idiot with a louder voice, certainly wasn't in his genes. The trouble was in his conditioning. Started when he was an adolescent. Give somebody an inch and they'll take two. Pretty soon they're walking all over you and you've become so used to it you don't complain. He thought of his job, of the eternal fitting of two wires in place. He was a cog and nothing more, a cog that could be replaced as swiftly, as efficiently as any part of an assembly line atomic engine could be replaced. He looked up into the blank, smiling, self-satisfied face of his wife. He thought of the stars beckoning overhead. The stars! No! He said suddenly, decisively. The word felt like a sledgehammer below in the stillness of the room. Dorothy's vacuous smile faded, uncomprehending. What? No, Sam said, trying to keep his voice even. I've changed my mind. I'm keeping the engine whether you like it or not. Dorothy's mouth hung open in surprise, and before she could recover enough to launch a fresh tirade, Sam Meacham had walked out, slamming the door behind him. He paused in the cool evening and gazed upward. The government had gone only to the moon. Sam Meacham was going to the stars. The next day, he was given the silent treatment. It had begun the night before, when he returned from his walk. Dorothy was in bed, awake and sniffling over the cruelty inflicted upon her by an unthoughtful husband. And when he came in, she turned her back and wouldn't speak. Sam didn't mind that. In fact, it was a welcome relief. But all night long she sniffled into her pillow, trying to win him over. Sam felt an odd mixture of sympathy and anger. Oh, shut up, he said finally, and stuck his head under the pillow. In the morning the treatment continued, but it was not totally silent, for Dorothy's air of hostility was now accompanied by low, sometimes indistinct, mumblings. Suddenly Sam said, This coffee's cold. If you don't like it, Dorothy said, and thrust her face near his, make some yourself. Sam half rose and gripped the table. Look, my lovely one, I'm the gent who brings home that weekly paycheck you can't get along without. Measly or not, it's good, honest, American dough that lets us live a little decently, and the least you could do is give me warm coffee in the morning. His voice had risen almost to a shout, and Sam himself was surprised at it. Dorothy's eyebrows crept into a bewildered frown, and like one in a trance, she moved to turn on the heat beneath the coffee pot. Sam's heart was beating swiftly as he sat down. Conditioned responses, he thought a little wildly. He'd started it off last night by defying Dorothy, and now, bit by bit, it was becoming easier. All he'd have to do was keep it up, see that he didn't lapse. He sipped the coffee slowly, as if tasting his recent triumph in the black liquid. You'd better hurry, Dorothy said, looking at him a little uneasily. Sam glanced at the wall clock and began gulping the hot liquid. Ten of eight? He'd have to hurry. He paused suddenly, the cup in midair, and wondered. Hurry to what? To those two wires? and the tester, and the endless stream of untested engines flowing toward him? With an infinite firmness, Sam Meacham placed his cup on the saucer. I'm not going in, he said. Dorothy looked at him as though he were crazy. What do you mean you're not going in? she demanded. Just because you've got some mullish notion in your head, do you think we have to starve? You're going in and liking it. The engine I bought is coming today, he said in a quiet voice. I want to install it. In Sam Meacham's eyes, there was a deadly fire that even his wife had not seen before. She gulped and backed away a little, but... Call up the foreman, Sam said. Tell him I'm sick. No, wait, he paused, smiling coldly. That would leave him an out. 
He could always go back to the job if he changed his mind, he said slowly. Tell him I've quit. Sam! Tell him I've quit, Sam insisted. That was the thing. Burn your bridges behind you so you can't turn back, so the only road is ahead. Sam Meacham was going to the stars, and he would never return. The atomic engine came that afternoon, neat and shiny and sleek, with all the wires in their proper places checked and double-checked by a sober human cog in the prison from which Sam Meacham had just escaped. Sam busied himself in the hangar, lifting out the old engine and replacing it with the new one. Carefully, he settled it into its housing and bolted it down. Then he rearranged the wires into the pattern outlined on the sheet of paper. Dorothy brought him coffee. That surprised him, but he accepted it gratefully. Can, can I help you, Sam? she offered. He looked at her, perhaps a little disappointed that her face was serious. He said, Sure you're not just trying to be nosy? A sharp pain darted into her eyes and she turned away. Wait, he said. He called himself a fool. It was another of her tricks, and he was falling for it. He put a restraining hand on her arm and remembered another time eight years ago when the touch would have sent electric thrills coursing through him. Oddly, he felt a small remnant of the pleasure stir within him. All right, he said gruffly. All right, you can help. So he was a fool. He'd been a fool before, and chances were he'd be one again, more often than he'd care to admit. In a short while, hours perhaps, he'd be gone, and he'd never see Dorothy again. Somehow the thought was not as comforting as he had expected, and he tried to work off a lingering doubt that rose to plague him. They worked through the afternoon, testing any weak parts the rocket might have, bracing the struts, checking for leaks. Sam found two spacesuits in the locker. He'd better leave one, he thought. They were expensive, and Dorothy might need one sometime. With him gone, she couldn't afford to throw money around. Yet he might need it more than she ever would. For a minute, he stood undecided, and then he put them both in the locker. Dorothy came into the room and smiled wearily at him. It'll go any place now, she told him proudly. In her eyes, Sam saw an indefinable something something he might have seen eight years ago, but mixed with it was a sadness he had not known she could possess. Guiltily, he turned his gaze away. We, we'd better go in and eat, he said, looking at his watch without seeing it. She didn't say anything, and that was odd. Sam wished she would nag and complain, as she always had before. He wondered why he wished that, when only a short time before he had wanted just the opposite. It was with a start that he realized the reason. He was running away. That was it. He was running away, and he wanted to be deathly certain that he had good cause to run. Slowly, the suspicion was creeping over him that the situation had changed slightly, was changing more. He would leave tonight, he told himself, before he weakened enough to shelve his plans for another comfortable rut. Sam's voice was a little hoarse. What are you doing here? What do you want? He had finished loading enough supplies aboard the rocket to last him months. Dorothy came toward him from the darkness. It's no use, he said. You can't talk me out of it this time. But she only smiled sadly and said, I know that, Sam. I came to say goodbye. Goodbye? You're leaving, aren't you? Yes. He looked at the ground, studying the darkness. I'm sorry, Sam, she said. We started out wrong. Maybe if we tried again. But Sam said quickly, No, I'm sorry too, but people don't change. The remark startled him. He had used it occasionally to rationalize his position, had been convinced of its undeniable truth, Yet suddenly he realized that he himself was its living denial. People could change, just as he had changed, 
just as Dorothy could change. It had been partly his fault when he first gave in to something he didn't want to do, and then to something else, and something else after that. He had helped dig the rut in which he had found himself, taking it for granted just as Dorothy had taken it for granted. Her hair was soft in the same moonlight that had shone eight years before, and Sam Meacham felt a desire that had been too long unfulfilled. Dorothy, I— he hesitated. The decision came hard to him, for much of his life had been devoted to giving in to the decision of others. This was the moment he had been waiting for, and now, at the last moment, he was uncertain. He said suddenly, "'Can you pack a few things?' "'Sam!' Her voice in the darkness was eager. Her hands touched his, soft hands. "'You'd better hurry,' he told her. Sam watched her go to the house, and doubts began to gnaw at him. Was he going to destroy his plans now at a whim? He felt an impulse to get into the rocket and leave without her. Yet he thought of the cold emptiness of space, and himself drifting through alien worlds, alone, lonely. Perhaps it was wrong, but he couldn't condemn her for something that was partly his fault. He was trying to become the person he once might have been, and it was only fair that she should have the same chance. Dorothy came hurrying back, a suitcase in her hand, and there was an eagerness about her that pleased him. He helped her put the suitcase on board. Dorothy, her voice was soft and low. Yes, Sam. Starlight danced in her eyes. He pulled her gently to him. He kissed her, and that night, eight years ago, came back and in his arms was the young, eager bride he had known, the one he loved. Minutes later, they rose on wings of fire in a slow upward spiral that quickened painlessly. Sam had not questioned the hyperdrive. It had worked in the factory, and it would work here. He watched the needle cross the dial in a swift, steady movement. Dorothy placed her hand in his. Where are we going, darling? Sam Meacham smiled at her, confident that he had made the most important decision in his life. He pointed through the forward window. Ahead of them lay the stars. End of The Odyssey of Sam Meacham by Charles E. Fritch Reading by Lisa S. Ware Say Hello For Me by Frank W. Coggins. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corey Morrill. This was to be the day, but of course Professor Pettibone had no way of knowing it. He arose, as he had been doing for the previous twenty years, donned the tattered remnants of his spacesuit, and went out into the open. He stood erect, bronzed, magnificent, faced distant earth, and recited, Good morning, bright sunshine. We're glad you are here. You make the world happy and bring us good cheer. It was something he had heard as a child, and, isolated here on Mars, he had remembered it and used it to keep from losing his power of speech. The ritual finished, he walked to the edge of the nearest canal and gathered a bushel or so of dried Martian moss. He returned and began polishing the shiny exterior of the wrecked spaceship. It had to really glitter if it was to be an effective beacon in guiding the rescue ship. Professor Pettibone knew, and had known for years, that a ship would come. It was just a matter of time, and as the year slipped by, his faith diminished not a whit. With his task half completed, he glanced up at the sun and quickened the polishing. It was a long walk to the place the berry bushes grew, and if he, too late, the sun would have dried out the night's crop of fragile berries, and he would wait until the morrow for nourishment. But on this day he was fated to arrive at the bush area, not at all, because an alien sound from above again drew the professor's eye from his work, and he knew that the day had arrived. The ship was three times as large as any he had ever visualized, and its futuristic design told him, sharply, how far he had fallen behind in his dreaming. 
He smiled and said, quite calmly, I dare say I am about to be rescued. And he experienced a thrill as the great ship set down and two men emerged therefrom. A thrill tinged with a guilt sense, because emotional experiences were rare in an isolated life, and seemed somehow indecent. The two men held weapons. They advanced upon Professor Pettibone, looked up into his face, reflected a certain wary hostility. That the hostility was tinged with instinctive respect, even awe, made it no less potent. One of them asked, Fella, man came in a ship, skyboat, long time ago. Him dead? Where? Appropriate gestures accompanied the words. Professor Pettibone smiled down at the little men and bowed. You are, of course, referring to me. I came in the ship. I am Professor Pettibone. It was nice of you to hunt me up. The eyes of the two Terran spacemen met and locked in a startled inquiry. One of them voiced the reaction of both when he said, What the hell? You no doubt are curious as to the fate of the other members of the expedition. They were all killed, all save Fletcher, who lasted a week. Professor Pettibone waved a hand. There, in the graveyard. But their eyes remained on the only survivor of that ill-fated first expedition. It was hard to accept him as the man they sought, but, faced with undeniable similarity between what they expected and what they had found, the two spacemen found no alternative. I hope your food supply is ample, and varied, Professor Pettibone said. This seemed to bring them out of their bemusement. Of course, Professor. Would you care to come aboard? The other made a try at congenial levity. You must be pretty hungry after twenty years. Really? Has it been that long? I tried to keep track at first. We can blast off any time you say. You're probably pretty anxious to get back. Indeed I am. The changes, in twenty years, must be breathtaking. I wonder if they'll remember me. A short time later, the professor said, It's amazing. A ship of this size handled by only two men? Then he sat down to a repast laid out by one of the odd spacemen. But, after nibbling a bit of this, a forkful of that, he found that satisfaction lay in the anticipation more so than the eating. "'We'll look around and see what we can find in the way of clothing for you, Professor,' one of the spacemen said. Then the man's bemusement returned. His eyes traveled over the ma magnificent physique before him. The perfect giant of a man, the great Apollo-like head with the calm, clear eyes, the expression of complete contentment and serenity. The spaceman said, "'Professor,' To what do you attribute the changes in your body? What is there about this planet? I really don't know, Professor Pettibone looked down to his torso with an impersonal eye. I think the greenish skin pigmentation is a result of mineral heavy vapors that occur during certain seasons. The growth? As to my body, I really don't know. But the two spacemen, though they didn't refer to it, were not concerned with the body so much as the aura of completeness, the radiation of contentment which came from somewhere within and it was passing strange that nothing more was said about the professor returning to earth. No great revelation suddenly arrived at that he would not go. Rather, they discussed various things that three gentlemen meeting casually would discuss. Then Professor Pettibone arose from his chair and said, It was kind of you to drop off and see me. And one of the spacemen replied, A pleasure, sir, a real pleasure indeed. Then the professor left the ship and watched it lift up on a trail of red fire and go away. He raised an arm and waved, "'Say hello for me,' he called. Then he turned away, and, from a force of habit, he began again to polish the hull, knowing that he would keep it shining and be proud of it for many years to come. Almost beyond reach of the planet, one of the spacemen flipped a switch and put certain sensitive communication mechanisms to work, so sensitive they could pick up etheric vibrations from far away and make them audible. But only faintly came the pleasant voice of a contented man. "'Good morning, bright sunshine. We're glad you are here.' You make the world the end. End of Say Hello For Me by Frank W. Coggins. Recording by Corey Morrill. Texas Week by Albert Hernhunter. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Nosetti Texas Week by Albert Hearn Hunter The slick black car sped along the wide and straight street. It came to a smooth stop in front of a clean white house. A man got out of the car and walked briskly to the door. Reaching out with a pink hand, he pressed the doorbell with one well-manicured finger. The door was answered by a housewife. 
She was wearing a white blouse, a green skirt, and a green apron trimmed with white. Her feet were tucked into orange slippers. Her blonde hair was done up in a neat bun. She was dressed as the government had ordered for that week. The man said, You are Mrs. Christopher Nest? There was a trace of anxiety in her voice as she answered, Yes, and you are? My name is Maxwell Hanstock. As you may already know, I am the official psychiatrist for this district. My appointment will last until the end of the year. Mrs. Nest invited him in. They stepped into a clean living room. At one end was the television set, at the other end were several chairs. There was nothing between the set and the chairs except a large gray rug which stretched from wall to wall. They walked to the chairs and sat down. Now, just what is the matter with your husband, Mrs. Nest? Mrs. Nest reached into a large bowl and absently picked up a piece of stale popcorn. She daintily placed it in her mouth and chewed thoughtfully before she answered. I wish I knew. All he does all day long is sit in the backyard and stare at the grass. He insists that he is standing on top of a cliff. Hanstock took out a small pad and a short ballpoint pen. He wrote something down before he spoke again. Is he violent? Did he get angry when you told him there was no cliff? Mrs. Nest was silent for a moment. A second piece of popcorn joined the first. Hanstock's pen was poised above the pad. No, he didn't get violent. Hanstock wrote as he asked the next question. Just what was his reaction? He said I must be crazy. Were those his exact words? No, he said that I was... She thought for a moment. Loco. Yes, that was the word. Loco? Yes, he said it just like those cowboys on the television. Anne Stark looked puzzled. Perhaps you had better tell me more about this. When did he first start acting this way? Mrs. Nest glanced up at the television set, then back at Anne Stark. It was right after Texas Week. You remember, they showed all those old cowboy pictures. Anne Stark nodded. Well, he stayed up every night watching them. Some nights he didn't even go to sleep. Even after the set was off, he sat in one of the chairs, just staring at the screen. This morning, when I got up, he wasn't in the house. I looked all over, but I couldn't find him. I was just about ready to phone the police when I glanced out the window into the backyard, and I saw him. What was he doing? He was just sitting there, in the middle of the yard, staring. I went out and tried to bring him into the house. He told me he had to watch for someone. When I asked him what he was talking about, he told me that I was crazy. That was when I phoned you, Mr. Hanstock. A very wise move, Mrs. Nest. And would you show me where your husband is right now? She nodded her head, and they both got up from the chairs. They walked through the dining room and kitchen. On the back porch, Hanstock came to a halt. You'd better stay here, Mrs. Nest. He walked to the door and opened it. Mr. Hanstock, Mrs. Nest called. Hanstock turned and saw her standing next to the automatic washing machine. Yes? Please be careful. Hanstock smiled. I shall be, Mrs. Nest. He walked out the door and down three concrete steps. Looking a little to his right, he saw a man squatted on his heels. He walked up to the man. You are Mr. Christopher Nest. The man looked up and stared for a moment at Hanstock. Yep, he answered. Then he turned and stared at the grass again. And may I ask you what you are doing? Nest answered without looking up. Garden a pass. Hanstock scribbled something in his notebook. And why are you guarding the pass? Nest rose to his feet and stared down at Hanstock. Just what are you asking all these questions for, stranger? Hanstock saw Nest was bigger than he and decided to play along for a while. After all, strategy. I'm just interested in your welfare, Mr. Nest. Nest shrugged his shoulders. 
He reached into his shirt pocket and pulled out a sack of tobacco and some paper. Holding a piece of paper in one hand, he carefully poured a little tobacco onto it. In one quick movement, he rolled the paper and tobacco into a perfect cylinder. He put the sack of tobacco and paper back into his pocket and took out a wooden kitchen match. He scraped it to life on the sole of his shoe and applied the flame to the tip of the cigarette. He puffed it into life and threw the match away. It burned for a few moments in the moist grass, then went out. A thin trail of smoke rose from it, and then was gone. Why are you guarding the pass? Hanstark asked again. Nest resumed his crouch on the grass. Nose is around, the dirty Dan, the cattle rustler is gonna try and steal some of my cattle. He patted an imaginary holster at his side, and I aim to stop him. Hanstark thought for a moment. Strategy. He must use strategy. Mr. Nest. He waited until Nest had turned to him. Mr. Nest, what would you say if I told you that there was no pass down there? Why, shucks, partner. I'd say you'd been chewing some loco weed. And if I could prove it? Nest answered after a moment's pause. Why, then? I guess I'd be loco. Hanstock thought it was going to be easy. Mr. Nest, it is a well-known fact that no one can walk in midair. Is that not true? Nest took a deep drag on his cigarette and blew the smoke out of his nostrils. Sure. Then, if I were to walk out above your pass, you'd have to admit there is no pass. Reckon so. Hanstark began to walk in the direction of Nest's cliff. Nest jumped to his feet and grabbed the official psychiatrist by the arm. What are you trying to do? Nest said angrily. Kill yourself? Hanstark shook free of his grasp. Mr. Nest, I am not going to kill myself. I am merely going to walk in that direction. He pointed to where the cliff was supposed to be. To you, it will look as if I were walking in mid-air. Nest dropped his hands to his sides. Shucks, I don't care if you kill yourself. It's just that it's liable to make the cattle nervous. And Stark gave him a cold glare and began to walk. He took three paces and stopped. You see, Mr. Nest, there is no cliff. Nest looked at him and laughed. You just take one more step and you'll find there is a cliff. And Stark took another step. A long one. His face bore a surprised look as he disappeared beneath the grass. His screams could be heard for a moment before he landed on the rocks below. Nest walked to the edge of the cliff and looked down at the mangled body. He took off his hat in respect. Little feller had a lot of guts. Then he added, Poor little feller. He put his hat back on and looked down at the entrance to the valley. A horse and rider appeared from behind several rocks. Dirty Dan! he exclaimed. He reached down and picked up his rifle. End of Texas Week by Albert Hearn Hunter Recording by David Nocetti davidnocetti.com There is a Reaper by Charles V. Duvet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. There is a Reaper by Charles V. Duvet. The amber brown of the liquor disguised the poison it held, and I watched with a smile on my lips as he drank it. There was no pity in my heart for him. He was a jackal in the jungle of life, and I, I was one of the carnivores. It is the lot of the jackals of life to be devoured by the carnivore. Suddenly the contented look on his face froze into a startled stillness. I knew he was feeling the first savage twinge of the agony that was to come. He turned his head and looked at me. 
and I saw suddenly that he knew what I had done. You murderer! He cursed me. And then his body arched in the middle, and his voice choked off deep in his throat. For a short minute he sat, tense, his body stiffened by the agony that rode it, unable to move a muscle. I watched the torment in his eyes build up to a crescendo of pain, until the suffering became so great that it filmed his eyes. And I knew that, though he still stared directly at me, he no longer saw me. Then, as suddenly as the spasm had come, the starch went out of his body and his back slid slowly down the chair edge. He landed heavily with his head resting limply against the seat of the chair. His right leg doubled up in a kind of jerk before he was still. I knew the time had come. Where are you? I asked. This moment had cost me sixty thousand dollars. Three weeks ago, the best doctors in the state had given me a month to live, and with seven million dollars in a bank, I couldn't buy a minute more. I accepted the doctor's decision philosophically, like the gambler that I am. But I had a plan, one which necessity had never forced me to use until now. Several years before, I had read an article about the medicine man of a certain tribe of aborigines living in the jungles at the source of the Amazon River. They had discovered a process in which the juice of a certain bush, known only to them, could be used to poison a man. Anyone subjected to this poison died. But for a few minutes after the life left his body, the medicine man could still converse with him. The subject, though ostensibly and actually dead, answered the medicine man's every question. This was their primitive, though reportedly effective, method of catching glimpses of what lay in the world of death. I had conceived my idea at the time I read the article, but I had never had the need to use it, till the doctors gave me a month to live. Then I spent my sixty thousand dollars, and three weeks later I held in my hands a small bottle of the witch doctor's fluid. The next step was to secure my victim, my collaborator, I preferred to call him. The man I chose was a nobody, a homeless, friendless non-entity, picked up off the street. He'd once been an educated man, but now he was only a bum, and when he died he'd never be missed. Perfect man for my experiment. I'm a rich man because I have a system. The system is simple. I never make a move until I know exactly where that move will lead me. My field of operations is the stock market. I spend money unstintingly to secure the information I need before I take each step. I hire the best investigators, bribe employees and persons in position to give me the information I want. And only when I am as certain as humanly possible that I cannot be wrong do I move. And the system never fails. Seven million dollars in the bank is proof of that. Now, knowing that I could not live, I intended to make this system work for me one last time before I died. I'm a firm believer in the adage that any situation can be whipped, given prior knowledge of its coming and, of course, its attendant circumstances. For a moment he did not answer, and I began to fear that my experiment had failed. Where are you? I repeated louder and sharper this time. The small muscles about his eyes puckered with an unnormal tension, while the rest of his face held its death frost. Slowly, slowly, and naturally, as though energized by some hyper-rational power, his lips and tongue moved. The words he spoke were clear. I am in a, a tunnel, he said. It is lighted dimly, but there is nothing for me to see. Blue veins showed through the flesh of his cheeks like watermarks on translucent paper. He paused, then I urged, Go on. I am alone, he said. The realities I knew no longer exist, and I am damp and cold. All about me is a sense of gloom and dejection. It is an apprehension an emanation so deep and real as to be almost a tangible thing. The walls on either side of me seem to be formed 
not of substance, but rather of the soundless cries of melancholy, of spirits I cannot see. I am waiting, waiting in the gloom for something which will come to me. That need to wait is an innate part of my being, and I have no thought of questioning it. His voice died again. What are you waiting for? I asked. I do not know, he said, his voice dreary with the despair of centuries of hopelessness. I only know that I must wait, that compulsion is greater than my strength to combat. The tone of his voice changed slightly. The tunnel about me is widening, and now the walls have receded into invisibility. The tunnel has become a plain. The plain is as desolate, as forlorn and dreary as was the tunnel. And I still stand and wait. How long must this go on? He fell silent again, and I was about to prompt him with another question. I could not afford to let time run out in long sentences, but abruptly the muscles about his eyes tightened, and suddenly a new aspect replaced their hopeless dejection. Now they expressed a black, bottomless terror. For a moment I marveled that so small a portion of a facial anatomy could express such horror. There's something coming toward me, he said. A beast of brutish foulness. Beast is too inadequate a term to describe it. But I know no words to tell its form. It is an intangible and evasive thing, but very real. And it is coming closer. It has no organs of sight as I know them. But I feel that it can see me. Or rather that it is aware of me, with a sense sharper than vision itself. It is very near now. Oh, God, the malevolence, the hate, the potentiality of awful fearsome destructiveness that is its very essence. And still I cannot move. The expression of terrified anticipation centered in his eyes, lessened slightly, and was replaced instantly by its former deep, deep despair. I am no longer afraid, he said. Why? I interjected. Why? I was impatient to learn all that I could before the end came. Because, he paused, because it holds no threat for me. Somehow, some day, I understand. I know that it, too, is seeking that for which I wait. What is it doing now? I ask. It has stopped beside me, and we stand together, gazing across the stark, empty plain. Now a second awful entity with the same leashed virulence about it moves up and stands at my other side. We all three wait, myself with the dark fear of this dismal universe my unnatural companions with patient, malicious menace. Bits of, he faltered, of, I can name it only aura, go out from the beasts like an acid stream, and touch me, and the hate and venom chills my body like a wave of intense cold. Now there are others of the awful breed behind me. We stand waiting waiting for that which will come. What it is, I do not know. I could see the power of death creeping steadily into the last corners of his lips, and I knew that the end was not far away. Suddenly a black frustration built up within me. What are you waiting for? I screamed, the tenseness and the importance of this moment forcing me to lose the iron self-control upon which I have always prided myself. I knew that the answer held the secret of what I must know. If I could learn that, my experiment would not be in vain, and I could make whatever preparations were necessary for my own death. I had to know that answer. Thank, thank, I pleaded. What are you waiting for? I do not know. The dreary despair in his eyes, sightless as they met mine, chilled me with a coldness that I felt in the marrow of my being. I do not know, he repeated. I, yes, I do know. 
Abruptly the plasmatic film cleared from his eyes, and I knew that for the first time since the poison struck he was seeing me clearly. I sensed that this was the last moment before he left, for good. It had to be now. "'Tell me, I command you,' I cried. "'What are you waiting for?' His voice was quiet as he murmured softly, implacably, before he was gone. "'We are waiting,' he said, "'for you.'" End of There is a Reaper by Charles V. DeVette Vanishing Point by C. C. Beck. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Joshua Burlow. Vanishing Point by C. C. Beck. In perspective, Theoretically, the vanishing point is at infinity, and therefore unattainable. But reality is different. Vanishment occurs a lot sooner than theory suggests. That? Oh, that's a perspective machine. Well, not exactly, but that's what I call it. No, I don't know how it works. Too complicated for me. Carter could make it go. But after he made it, he never used it. Too bad. He thought he'd make a lot of money with it there for a while, while he was working it out. Almost had me convinced. But I told him, get it to working first, Carter, and then show me what you can do with it better than I can do without it. I'm doing pretty well as is. Pictures selling good, even if I do make them all by guesswork, as you call it. That's what I told him. You see, Carter was one of them artists that think they can work everything out by formulas and stuff. Me, I just paint things as I see them. Never worry about perspective and all that kind of mechanical aids. Never even went to art school. But I do all right. Carter now was a different sort of artist. Well, he wasn't really an artist, more of a draftsman. I first got him in to help me with a series of real estate paintings I got an order for. Big aerial views of land developments and drawings of buildings, roads, and causeways, that kind of stuff. Was a little too much for me to handle alone, because I never studied that kind of things, you know. I thought he'd do the mechanical drawings, which should have been simple for anybody trained that way and I'd throw in the colors, figures, and trees, and so on. He did fine. Job came out good. Client was real happy. We made a pretty good amount on the job, enough to keep us for a couple months without working afterwards. I took it easy, fishing and so on, but Carter stayed here in the studio working on his own stuff. I let him keep an eye on things for me around the place and just dropped in now and then to check up. The guy was nuts on the subject of perspective. I thought he knew all there was to know about it already, but he claimed nobody knew anything about it, really. Said he'd been studying it for years, and the more he learned about it, the more there was to learn. He used to cover big sheets of paper with complicated diagrams trying to prove something or other to himself. I'd come into the studio and find him with thumbtacks and strings and stuff all over the place. He'd get big long rulers and draw lines to various points all over the room and end up with a little drawing of a cube about an inch square that anybody could have made in half a minute without all the apparatus. Seemed pretty silly to me. Then he brought in some books on mathematics and physics and other things and a bunch of slide rules, calculators, and junk. He must have been a pretty smart guy to know how to handle all those things, even if he was kind of dopey about other things. You know, women and fishing and sports and drinking. He was lousy at everything except working those perspective problems. 
Personally, I couldn't see much sense to what he was doing. The guy could draw all right already, so I asked him what more did he want. Let me see if I can remember what he said. I'm trying to get at things as they really are, not as they appear, he said. I think those were his words. Art is an illusion, a bag of tricks. Reality is something else, not what we think it is. Drawings are two-dimensional projections of a world that is not merely three, but four-dimensional, if not more, he said. Yeah, kind of a crackpot, Carter was. Just on that one subject, though, nice enough guy otherwise. Here, look at some of the drawings he made, working out his formulas. Nice designs, huh? Might make good wallpaper or fabric patterns. Real abstract. That's what people seem to like. See all those little letters scattered around among all the lines? Different kinds of vanishing points they are. Carter claimed the whole world was full of vanishing points. You don't know what a vanishing point is? Let me see if I can explain. Come over to the window here. You see how that road out there gets smaller and smaller in the distance? Of course, the road doesn't really get smaller. It just looks that way. That's what we call a vanishing point in drawing. Simple, isn't it? Never could understand why Carter went to so much trouble working on all those ways to locate vanishing points. Me, I just throw them in whenever I need them. But Carter claimed that was wrong said they were all connected together in some way, and he was going to work out a method to prove it. Here, here's a little gadget he made up to help his calculations. Bunch of discs all pivoted together at the center. You're supposed to turn them around so the arrows point to the different figures and things. Here's the square root sign. I remember Carter telling me that. This one is a tangent function, whatever that means. Log there is short for logarithm. Oh, he had a bunch of that scientific stuff in his head all the time. Don't know whether he understood it all himself. He built this thing just before he put together the perspective machine there. Silly looking gadget, huh? All them pipes and wires and that little cube in the center. Don't try to touch it. It ain't really there. You just think it is. It's what Carter called a tetaract or a cataract. No, that ain't the right word. Something like that, tesser something or other. There's a picture like it in one of Carter's books. Hurts your eyes to look at it, don't it? That's what Carter thought was going to make him a lot of fame and money. That perspective machine. I told him nobody would ever make a drawing machine yet that worked. But he said it wasn't supposed to make drawings. It was just supposed to give people a view of what reality really is, instead of what they think it is. I don't know whether he expected to charge money to look through it, or whether he was going to look through it himself and make some new kind of drawings and sell them. Now, I can't tell you how it works. I said before, I don't know. Carter only used it once himself. I came in here the day he finished it, just as he was ready to turn it on. He was just putting the finishing touches on it. In a few minutes, he told me, I'll have the answer to a question that may never have been answered before. What is reality? Is the world a thing by itself, and all we know illusion? Why do things grow smaller the farther away from us they appear? Why can't we see more than one side of anything at a time? What happens to the far side of an object? Does it cease to exist just because we can't see it? Are objects not present, non-existent? Because artists draw things vanishing to points, does that mean that they really vanish? A whack, that's what he was. Nice guy, but sort of screwy. He kept saying more goofy things while he was finishing up the machine about how he figured out that all we knew about vision and drawing and so on must be wrong, and that once he got a look at the real world, he'd prove it. How about cameras, I asked him. Take a picture with a camera, and it looks just about the same as a drawing, don't it? 
That's because cameras are built to take pictures like we're used to seeing them, he said. Flat, two-dimensional slices of reality without depth or motion. Even 3D moving pictures, I asked? They're closer to reality, he admitted, but they are still only cross-sections of it. The shutter of a movie camera is closed as much of the time as it is open. What happens in between the times it's open? You know, he went on, people used to think matter and motion were continuous, but scientists have proved that they are discontinuous. Now some of them think time may be too. Maybe everything is just imaginary and appears to our senses in whatever way we want it to appear. We are so well trained that we see everything just as we are taught to see it by generations of artists, writers, and other symbol makers. If we could see things as they really are, what might happen? We'd probably all go nuts, I told him. He just smiled. Well, here goes, he said. It's finished. Now to find out who is right, the scientists and philosophers who say reality is forever unreachable, or the artists who say there isn't any reality, that we make the whole thing up to suit ourselves. He moved one of those pointers you see there, and squinted around at the different scales and dials, and then stepped back. That little Tessie thing appeared, real small at first. Just a point. You could hardly see it. I couldn't see anything else happening, and thought he was going to do something else to the machine. I turned to look at Carter, and saw his face white as a sheet. Good God, he says, just like that. Good God! That's all. Well, I says to him, who was right, the scientists or the artists? The artists, he sort of screeches. The artists were right all the time. There is no reality. It's all a fabric of illusion we've created ourselves. And now I've ripped a hole in that. He gives a strangled hoot and goes hightailing it out of here like something was after him. Jumps in his car and roars off down the road and disappears. Nah, I don't mean he really disappeared. Are you nuts? Just roared on down the road till he got so small I couldn't see him no more. You know, the way things do when they go farther and farther away. Happens every day. That's what us artists mean by perspective. The machine? Well, I don't know what to do with it. If Carter ever comes back, he might not like my getting rid of it. I was thinking maybe I'd put it in the hobby show at the county fair next week, though. You notice how that funny-looking cube inside there gets bigger every time you look at it? There, it just doubled its size again, see? People at the fair ought to get a big kick out of that. No telling how big it'll get with all those people looking at it. But come on, let's go fishing. We better hurry or it'll be too late. End of Vanishing Point by C.C. Beck Recording by Joshua Burlow We Didn't Do Anything Wrong, Hardly, by Roger Kuykendall. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. We Didn't Do Anything Wrong, Hardly, by Roger Kuykendall. I mean, it isn't like we swiped anything. We maybe borrowed a couple of things, like... But, gee, we put everything back where we found it. Pretty near. Even, like, the compressor we got from Stinky Brinker that his old man wasn't using and I traded my outboard motor for. My old my father made me trade back. But it was like Skinny said. You know Skinny. Skinny Thompson? He's the one you guys keep calling the boy genius. Shucks, he's no. Well, yeah, it's like Skinny said we didn't need an outboard motor and we did need a compressor you got to have a compressor on a spaceship everybody knows that and that old compression chamber that old man i mean mr fields let us use didn't have a compressor sure he said we could use it anyway he said we could play with it 
and Skinny said we were going to make a spaceship out of it, and he said, go ahead. Well, no, he didn't say it exactly like that. I mean, well, he didn't take it serious, sort of. Anyway, it made a swell spaceship. It had four portholes on it, and an airlock, and real bunks in it, and lots of room for all that stuff that Skinny put in there. But it didn't have a compressor, and that's why. What stuff? Oh, you know, the stuff that Skinny put in there. Like the radar he made out of a TV set, and the anti-gravity, and the atomic power plant he invented to run it all with. He's awful smart, Skinny is. But he's not like what you think of a genius. You know, he's not all the time using big words, and he doesn't look like a genius. I mean, we call him Skinny because he used to be skinny. But he isn't now. I mean, maybe he's small for his age. Anyway, he's smaller than me, and I'm the same age as he is. Of course, I'm big for my age, so that doesn't mean much, does it? Well, I guess Stinky Brinker started it. He's always riding Skinny about one thing or another. But Skinny never gets mad, and it's a good thing for Stinker, too. I saw Skinny clean up on a bunch of ninth graders. Well, a couple of them, anyway. They were saying... Well, I guess I won't tell you what they were saying. Anyway, Skinny used judo, I guess, because there wasn't much of a fight. Anyway, Stinker said something about how he was going to be a rocket pilot when he grew up, and I told him that Skinny had told me that there wouldn't be any rockets, and that anti-gravity would be the thing as soon as it was invented. So Stinker said it never would be invented, and I said it would so, and he said it would not, and I said, well, if you're going to keep interrupting me, how can I... All right. Anyway, Skinny broke into the argument and said that he could prove mathematically that anti-gravity was possible. And Stinky said, sure, he could. And Skinny said, sure, he could. And Stinky said, sure, he could. Like that. Honestly, is that any way to argue? I mean, it sounds like two people agreeing. Only Stinky keeps going, sure, like that, you know? And Stinky, what does he know about mathematics? He's had to take remedial arithmetic ever since. No, I don't understand how the anti-gravity works. Skinny told me, but it was something about meson flow and stuff like that that I didn't understand. The atomic power plant made more sense. Where did we get what uranium? Gee, no, we couldn't afford uranium. So Skinny invented a hydrogen fusion plant. Anyone can make hydrogen. You just take zinc and sulfuric acid and... Deuterium? You mean like heavy hydrogen? No. Skinny said it would probably work better, but like I said, we couldn't afford anything fancy. As it was, Skinny had to pay five or six dollars for that special square tubing in the anti-gravity, and the plastic space helmets we had cost us 98 cents each. And it cost a dollar and a half for that special tube that Skinny needed to make the TV set into a radar. You see, we didn't steal anything, really. It was mostly stuff that was just lying around. Like the TV set was up in my attic, and the old refrigerator that Skinny used the parts to make the atomic power plant out of from, and then a lot of the stuff we already had, like the skin-diving suits we made into space suits, and the vacuum pump that Skinny already had, and the generator. Sure, we did a lot of skin diving, but that was last summer. That's how we knew about old man Brinker's compressor that Skinny said was his, and I traded my outboard motor for and had to trade back. And that's how we knew about Mr. Fields' old compression chamber, and all like that. The rocket? Well, it works on the same principle as the atomic power plant. Only it doesn't work except in a vacuum, hardly. Of course, you don't need much of a rocket when you have anti-gravity. Everyone knows that. Well, anyway, that's how we built the spaceship. And believe me, it wasn't easy. I mean, with Stinky all the time bothering us and laughing at us. And I had to do a lot of lawn mowing to get money for that square tubing for the anti-gravity and the special tube for the radar and my space helmet. Stinky called the space helmets kid stuff. He was always saying things like, say hello to the folks on Mars for me, bring back a bottle of Canal Number no. 5 and all like that, you know. Of course, they did look like kids' stuff, I guess. We bought them at the Five and Dime, and they were meant for kids. 
Of course, when Skinny got through with them, they worked fine. We tested them in the airlock of the compression chamber when we got the compressor in. They tested out pretty good for a half hour. Then we tried them on in there. Well, it wasn't a complete vacuum, just 27 inches of mercury, but that was okay for a test. So anyway, we got ready to take off. Stinky was there to watch, of course. He was saying things like, Farewell, O oh brave pioneers, and stuff like that. I mean, it was enough to make you sick. He was standing there laughing and singing something like, Up in the air, junior bird men. But when we closed the airlock door, we couldn't hear him. Skinny started up the atomic power plant, and we could see Stinky laughing fit to kill. It takes a couple of minutes for it to warm up, you know, so Stinky started throwing rocks to attract our attention, and Skinny was scared that he'd crack a porthole or something. So he threw the switch and we took off. Boy, you should have seen Stinky's face. I mean, you really should have seen it. One minute he was laughing, you know, and the next minute he looked like a goldfish. I guess he always did look like a goldfish, but I mean even more like then. And he was getting smaller and smaller, because we had taken off. We were gone pretty near six hours, and it's a good thing my mom made me take a lunch. Sure, I told her where we were going. Well, anyway, I told her we were maybe going to fly around the world in Skinny and my spaceship, or maybe go down to Carson's Pond, and she made me take a lunch and made me promise I wouldn't go swimming alone, and I sure didn't. But we did go around the world, three or four times. I lost count. Anyway, that's when we saw the satellite, on radar. So Skinny pulled the spaceship over to it, and we got out and looked at it. The spacesuits worked fine, too. Gosh, no, we didn't steal it or anything. Like Skinny said, it was just a menace to navigation, and the batteries were dead, and it wasn't working right anyway. So we tied it onto the spaceship and took it home. No, we had to tie it on top. It was too big to take inside, with the antennas sticking out. Of course, we found out how to fold them later. Well, anyway, the next day, the Russians started squawking about a capitalist plot, and someone had swiped their satellite. Gee, I mean, with all the satellites up there, who'd miss just one? So I got worried that they'd find out we took it. Of course, I didn't need to worry, because Stinky told them all right, just like a tattletale. So anyway, after Skinny got the batteries recharged, we put it back. And then when we landed, there were hundreds of people standing around. And Mr. Anderson from the State Department. I guess you know the rest. Except maybe Mr. Anderson started laughing when we told him. And he said it was the best joke on the Russians he ever heard. I guess it is when you think about it. I mean, the Russians complaining about somebody swiping their satellite and then the State Department answering, a couple of kids borrowed it, but they put it back. One thing bothers me, though. We didn't put it back exactly the way we found it. But I guess it doesn't matter. You see, when we put it back, we goofed a little. I mean, we put it back in the same orbit, more or less. But we got it going in the wrong direction. End of We Didn't Do Anything Wrong, Hardly, by Roger Kuykendall.